I'm going to go ahead and get us kicked off. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to Benji and let him take it. I'm actually going to go help with sixth grade science. So y'all are going to have a lot more fun than I am. <laughs> um, so this is Oral History at Home. And it's a program of the Central Arkansas Library System and their Roberts Library for Arkansas History and Art. And today, um, Benji De La Piedra. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. I have been practicing. I've only known Benji for like two or three years, and I can't pronounce his name right. <clears throat> it's a real problem. <clears throat> you don't see the big E post it note. <laughs> over my <laughs> over my monitor <laughs> so um but yes yay i got it right um so i want to welcome everybody to this benji is an oral historian um, he got his master's at columbia and so he is the pro at this um, he's going to tell you all the ins and outs of what oral history means and kind of the bigger conversation you're wanting to have and then there will be time for everybody to ask questions. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I will be back. Um, hopefully. Uh, be before you go, Heather, yes. um, I think I need to be made a co-host. Yes, you do. To share my screen. Um, thank you for reminding me. Uh, thank you. Um, but while Heather's setting that up, um, it looks like we have another nice small group with a couple of repeat offenders here. Um, so let's uh, let's just go around the room. Um, those of you who've already done this with me know that I tend to, um, like any oral historian, I think, like do best in the dialogue. And so I'll I'll make my presentation about what I call the spirit of oral history and uh, the most important parts of the approach. Um, but I'm really interested in what brings you to the room, to the Zoom room today, and specifically, what do you think you're going to use oral history for? And before um, you kick that off, one thing I forgot to say, this is being recorded. I have to, I keep forgetting to tell people that. You are being recorded. Um, we have not put any of these up on YouTube, but that is the plan to put it up on YouTube. So just think about that, um, you know, when you're talking. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Who wants to go first? Don't be shy. I'll go. So um, my name is Robert Lindley. I've been doing family history for probably the better part of 20 years. Um, retired in 2017 and I'm uh, really focused a lot, especially given COVID and quarantine on family history because it seems to be something I could do sitting here in my office. Um, uh, the primary thing I'm looking today, you know, this is my second time back to listen to you, Benji. Uh, look forward to, to getting reinforced some of the things I heard before. Um, I'm very interested in learning more about how I can share what I'm collecting. So, um, you know, I'm finding that, uh, you know, if I'm going to record these things, um, sharing them on Ancestry.com along with the profiles of the people that I might be interviewing or the people they might be talking about is is going to be very limited given the size of the file i can upload at 15 meg mm -hmm. okay great great um perfect and i'm just going to go ahead and just kind of take notes in the chat here so how to share work collecting that's great and i think the the robert you were there the first time that i took um or that i gave this workshop and um like that first session this one will focus more on how to approach the interview and how to think about the interview but like i said last time um if there's enough of an appetite for thinking about the other steps in the oral history process, which, um, you know, sharing what we're collecting, we can also refer to that as interpretation, publication. Um, that's something that we definitely can can uh, start looking towards even even today. So thanks for bringing us there. Um, Derek wrote in the chat. Uh, he's on a computer without a microphone. Interested in oral history and building the archives of my association. Very cool. So Derek, if you are able to in the chat, just tell us a little bit more about your association and. Um, what kind of oral history you think you're going to be doing um, on, on your own time uh, while he does that. Who wants to go next? I can go next. Hi. Hi, I'm Linda, and I am going to be working with um, Benji's support with a group of elementary school students who are going to do um, interviews of family members and teachers. And haven't settled on the, the questions yet, but I think it's going to have, it's going to focus 
generally on equity, um, issues of equity. Very good. Thanks, Ms. Linda. Mm -hmm. Who else you're next? Hi, Minda. Um, Julia and I are actually going to be working on a oral history project together, uh, focusing on lesbian elders and uh, sharing the stories of lesbian elders. Um, so kind of uh, like what was already said, I'm definitely interested in how to share like a lot of the technological aspects of how to make these um, oral histories available to other people once, uh, once they're recorded. And also generally how to um, best approach uh, the interviews and how to um, encourage other people to be involved because it's really uh, one of the things is a sense of community. So the community building aspect of oral histories, I think is what's important to me mm -hmm. in the project. Great. You wanna say a word, Julia? Yeah, um, I think just to add on to everything that Minda said, um, I think the outreach part of it is something that I'm very curious about and how to involve people and how to get people willing to participate um, as well as how to disseminate the information afterwards. So yeah, pretty much everything everyone else is talking about. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and before I turn to Derek, um, let me just ask to the both of you just a, a follow-up question. Um, is your project going to be about lesbian elders like in the state of Arkansas or more generally like what's the um, the kind of scope of your study and I'm curious as well about um, your intended audience like do you see this as being for like widely public con and of course these things you know it can always be for more than one audience this is something about oral history we can talk about um, but do you feel like your priority is more for like a general public or is it more for let's say a more intimate audience maybe like lesbian youngsters or something do you, do you see the difference there yeah, um, it's not going to be limited to one state. We're trying to get as, I think, as broad of uh, possible. And I think um, intergenerational, again, mm -hmm. for like the grander community sense is, is more of the goal. Great. Thank you. I'm going to talk real quick. I'm, I'm Glenn Whaley. I'm the manager of the Roberts Library at the Central Arkansas Library System. So I work with Mindy and Heather both, and I'm just here to see what you guys are interested in. I need to keep up with what the community wants to know about and, and what we can help support Mindy and his efforts with. I'm glad you're all here. Thanks, Glenn. Mm -hmm. So cool. So we have a nice um, small assortment of projects here. So just to recap, so we have Robert doing family history. Um, Ms. Linda's doing um, a history of the school that she helped found, um, and that's going to have a neat feature, which is the fourth and fifth graders are going to be interviewing some of the adults who make up the school community, um, and that, that'll be uh, a real treat, I think. Um, then Mindy, Minda and Julia are working on um, the Lesbian Elders Project, um, and then finally Derek, who I now see is with Pulaski County Medical Society. I didn't look at the, um, the insignia there. Um, but Derek is uh, with a local medical association made up of doctors. Uh, the board wants to begin archiving the stories of retired members and their and the changes they've seen in medicine over decades. So that's great. That's like a really um, like oral history is the tool to use for that for sure. Um, one of the things that oral history is really good at, of course, is framing people um, not only as um, witnesses to their own experiences and their own memories, but also witness to larger changes, right? Historical change, social change. Um, as one of my great teachers, Mary Marshall Clark, put it the very first class I took with her, um, oral history is uniquely and especially suited to documenting change over time um, because taking the life history approach, which I'll, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, it, it, position, it, it sets people up to talk about not only the changes they've seen exterior to them, but the changes in their own perception over time. I used to look at it this way, but then I went through this experience and now I see it this way um, or that way. Um, so anyways, we can get into more specifics, but um, just wanted to um, emphasize how great I think all your projects are. So let's get into it. Um, and like I said, at any point, feel free to jump in, um, ask questions, um, you know, make, especially apply it to your projects. Again, we have such a small group here um, and two people have already heard me give, um, it's more than a spiel, but have heard me give this talk. 
Um, and so let's take it in whatever direction feels most useful in the next hour and change. Um, any questions before I start? I queue up my little share screen here. Ah, sorry, y'all. I'm on a new Mac that has this like fancy touchscreen thing that actually makes it harder to use. There we go. Okay. So, um, those of you who know me know that I can talk about oral history all day. I love oral history. Um, I think of it not just as a research practice um, or even an approach to like thinking about people. It certainly is those two things. Um, but for me personally, and I encourage you at least as far as your projects go and beyond um, to adopt this as well. Um, I really think of oral history as a way of life, as a calling, um, as a way of relating to people, um, not just in research situations. Um, Oral history, as I will talk about now, is more of a spirit, I think, than a method um, or a particular um, formula for doing work. Um, I think you can imbue the spirit of oral history into any project that is based on conversation or based on encounters um, and based on talking to people. Um, so I'm just gonna run through uh, what I think of as kind of the major dimensions of the spirit of oral history as far as I've been able to ascertain it by way of um, you know, taking my degree in it, but really through through project work and through practice and trial and error. Um, so let me take this moment to also say that um, that's the best way to learn oral history is by doing it and by thinking critically um, about your own approaches. Um, in that way, oral history is certainly an art form um, more than like a scientific method. Um, it's not necessarily, it's, it's not to the exclusion of scientific method and scientific reasoning, but um, in terms of how we approach it um, and the kind of improvisation that's called for in the interview, certainly more of an art form. Um, so yeah, let me begin again by talking about the spirit of oral history. I'm trying to address you know, the basic question, which is what is oral history? Um, oral history, you know, point number one here, and, and just so you know, kind of the way that my mind works, I put up these words here um, because this should come in as, as no surprise, like oral historians, we love words, right? Um, and so the way that I think about defining oral history um, I think of these words as just important to have in mind um, on the board, so to speak, or, or literally in this case. Um, so the first thing to think about is time and people. Like these are the two basic things that oral history um, documents deals with. Um, and really I should reverse this to say people and time. Um, we're interested in people first and foremost concretely, but we understand that people exist in time. Um, and just like I was saying, you know, change happens over time. Um, the way that oral historians think about time is a little bit different from the conventional way I think that we, especially as Americans in the modern world are conditioned to think about time. What do I mean by that? I mean that when we think about our relationship to the past, um, conventionally we're taught to think of it as the past is no longer with us once it's past, right? Um, the moment has ceased to exist. If we're talking about something that happened in the past, um, it's, it's in some realm that is no longer with us. Um, oral historians see it differently. And for some, this is quite intuitive. So maybe this isn't even such a like aha thing. This can actually be more kind of closer to how people themselves feel. But um, for oral historians, it's very important to remember that people carry the past with them everywhere they go. Um, when someone walks into a room, the past has conditioned the way in which they will experience that room and the contributions they will make to that room. Um, and so when we are, as oral historians, looking to document the past, we understand that the way that a person thinks about the past is conditioned by the present, right? And so for instance, like um, in the wake of the beginning of the pandemic, um, a lot of oral history projects started looking specifically at questions of health, questions of isolation. Um, right, like present themes tend to condition what we think of as important from the past. Um, and as oral historians, we understand that any narrative that gets made about the past, which is to say history, like history is a narrative. Um, and so we are generally aware of how historical narratives do not include, it's not like the entire past is included in any historical narrative. Historical narratives themselves are the product of 
selection, of sequencing, um, and they evolve and change over time, um, again, responding to present concerns and present insights. Um, and the same goes the other way too. So the way that people talk about the present, of course, is also conditioned by the past. Um, so all this, again, might be intuitive to some of us in the room here, um, but it's all, and so it's all kind of summed up in um, that famous William Faulkner quote, the past is never past, it's barely even gone, right? Um, we can also talk about, um, and I'm trying to kind of keep from being too heady, but we can also talk about um, oral history's relationship to the future and its real concern with the future. As much as oral historians talk to people about the past, it's actually a very future-oriented art form and, and form of research. Um, everything we do is with the awareness in mind that this interview might be listened to a hundred years from now when the present is the past, right? And so we're making a document not only of the past, um, I don't want to get my wires crossed here. It's not only a document of the past that is in the present moment of the interview. It's also a document, right? In documenting that present moment, that's also helping to create a historical record. There's layers to it. So it's a record of not just what the narrator is talking about, but also of the moment actually within which the narrator and the interviewer are talking. Um, so again, questions about the pandemic might come up um, or might be used to filter, to select certain details about the past um, that are seen as significant. All of that is of value to future, um, not just researchers, but people who will encounter the interview. Um, and so for instance, I think I said this um, in a previous workshop, um, a question that is always good to ask, especially at the end of an interview, is what do you want someone 100 years from now to know about your experience or to know about the Pulaski County Medical Association, right, or to know about this school? Um, again, always having that awareness that there's a kind of future audience in mind. Um, that's part of what distinguishes, I think, oral history interviews from um, especially like journalistic interviews, which are so for the present and are not archived, um, but also even like you know, uh, like more traditional social science, qualitative um, research methods. Um, they're not quite as um, archivally minded. Um, and so that's part of what distinguishes um, the spirit of oral history. Even if your interviews that you do as an oral historian are not for the archive, I think that awareness that what we're doing is for a future um, and for helping people understand how we helped make that future, which for them will be the present. Um, that's the kind of mentality that we bring into the interviews. Um, before I take questions, let me jump to number two, because if we're talking about the past and how people carry it with them, um, naturally we have to talk about memory, right? Memory is the stuff of, like memory is like the clay that we as oral historians sculpt, so to speak, or help people, the narrators themselves kind of sculpt. Um, memory is our kind of basic material. Um, how do we get at memories and how do we make them significant or usable to the oral historian? Um, and to the audiences that the oral historian is engaging. I'm a big proponent of taking what's called the life history approach, which I'll explain in the next slide. Um, the life history approach typically begins with the question, when and where were you born? Tell me a little bit about your early life or a little bit about how you were raised. Um, walk me through some uh, you know, early influences um, with regards to your experience of, so for instance, let, let's take, um, uh, uh, Derek, is that your name? It's not popping up on my Zoom here. Um, I think it's Derek, uh, the, the Medical Association Project. Um, you know, an early question you might ask in the life history interview, you know, two or three questions in, you might ask, um, what was your first exposure to doctors, right? Like what, what was your earliest conception of doctors? Um, did you have doctors in your family? Um, or to get even more kind of thematic, a little broader, you might even ask, you know, when did you first start thinking about health, right? Like what were your early experiences of these uh, these kind of themes that later in the interview we'll get more into the nitty gritty of, um, you know, we'll start talking about um, what led you to choose the medical profession. Um, what were your early experiences of medical school like? Um, are they different? Let's assume that one of the people that he's interviewing um, now teach, let's say at a medical school, you know, that, that narrator might be a really good person to ask the question, uh, you know, how is it different, right? We're talking about change over time, right? So now in your experience as let's say a medical teacher yourself, how has the approach changed from you know, 30 or 40 years ago? Um, this gets us into the second um, little sub word I put here or, or term, which is the personal meaning of events. This should be a plural, sorry about that. Um, in oral history, we, 
we understand that, so let me take a step back. One of the big critiques that oral history has always had to deal with from its inception as a research method in this country, which goes back to the late 40s, um, and that is to say as like an academic research method, of course, oral history is as old as people themselves, right? But as a, as a kind of research method, um, oral history has had to deal with a lot of traditional historians who work with written documents really like looking down their noses at us and saying, well, if you're dealing with people and you're dealing with memories, like you can't trust that, right? Like people's memories change, you know, people are subjective. That's like a really dirty word for the traditional historical profession. Um, you can't trust people to really tell you what it was like because they're gonna have bias, because they're gonna somehow contaminate the data with their own opinions. Um, they're gonna shape the story in a way that's not a real accurate representation of what the past was like. Um, Oral historians, it took us a couple decades, it took us until about the 60s, early 70s to be able to really say this, but oral historians have at this point arrived at a point of being able to say, so, of course it's subjective. Um, any written document you deal with is also subjective. Um, it was written by a person. Um, and so that's not to say that we take people entirely at their word about what the past was like. Um, you know, We ask follow-up questions. We of course consult the written record and check facts. Um, after the interview or, or before the interview, like there, it's not an either or between, you know, like spoken verbal oral sources and written sources, um, but rather we as oral historians understand that the real value of what we can provide is an account of the sense and the meaning that people made of events as they remember them. Um, and so we can talk about how that applies to your specific projects, but I just want you to keep that in mind that we as oral historians embrace subjectivity um, we embrace the fact that people have points of view that are shaped by earlier life experiences. Um, and we think that that's really interesting and really worth analyzing. Um, so just a quick example, um, Columbia, where, Columbia University, where I did my master's program in, in oral history, um, one of their big flagship projects was um, in the early mid, it was a long project. It was several years over the mid 2000s. Um, Columbia interviewed about 600 New Yorkers uh, who were in New York on September 11th, 2001. But rather than starting with the more obvious question of where were you on 9-11, um, the interviews started with, okay, tell me about when and where were you born? Tell me about your family. Did you grow up in New York? If not, where did you grow up? When did you move to New York? These interviews would proceed for several hours um, and sometimes multiple sessions before getting to the question, okay, now where were you on 9-11? And so what that does is it provides a much richer context. Um, it does a couple of things, actually. First of all, it provides that context um, so that as the researcher, the listener, um, we can make sense of um, you know, the, uh, the actual memories that are shared of the event in question or the event that um, has set the research agenda for the interview. Um, but also by starting with the life history approach, I think I've found an experience through experience that it gets people in kind of a mood and a rhythm of remembering. Um, people need to warm up to their memories a little bit or warm up to kind of get into that zone. Um, going back to point number one, actually, something I forgot to mention, in terms of time, I think you guys will experience um, as you do your interviews, time feels a little different in the interview, actually. It tends to slow down, um, especially if you're good at um, keeping silent, which is something I really um, encourage you all to do. Um, like you wanna give people room and time and space to let their memories come up and have them narrate, have, have the narrators narrate those memories as fully as they can. Um, and so just that kind of zone that you get into as an interviewer, um, you'll find it's better, you know, if, if the real payoff in the interview for you is gonna be, you know, accounts of, um, you know, being a member of the Pulaski County Medical Association or, um, you know, in, uh, in, in, in Linda's project, uh, you know, an account of, of the school's founding, let's say. Um, if you get people in that mood of, you know, remembering their memories in that full way, that payoff will be that much better, I think, than if you lead with it. Um, you you want to kind of build up to it. Um, the third point, and this is just a, something just to throw out there, it's almost, um, it's pretty obvious, but it's worth saying, oral historians deal with oral sources, that is to say verbal sources. Um, and so as a result of that, like we, or at least I can speak for myself, like we love the ways that people talk. We find them really interesting. 
um, and we find them kind of delightful, actually. Um, that's like the word I would use is oral historians really delight in the ways that people talk um, and the ways that people express themselves and the range of speech that um, goes beyond what might be seen as acceptable in writing. Um, we tend to want people to sound like themselves in the interview. Um, and so that kind of boils down to these two parts that I think of. There's stories, right? Like you want people to tell stories as fully as they can, and we love stories. Um, and then there's also vernacular. And that goes back to what I was saying just now about um, we want people to sound like themselves. Um, we, you know, if someone uses a word um, that seems to indicate something about the community that we're interviewing in or about, um, you might, a kind of question you can always go to is, um, you know, what is that word? You know, you use this word um, a few minutes ago, like what exactly does it mean? Or when did you first hear this word? Um, when was it first introduced to you? Um, so we can talk more about that, but I think it's worth putting out there that the spoken word, um, of course, is what we're most interested in, not just documenting, but again, like dealing with um, and engaging with. Um, this goes to skipping ahead to point number six, the co-creative um, element of oral history. It's a conversation. It's, it's speaking and listening and giving and receiving in that way. Um, point number four, um, relationships is perhaps the most important um, kind of element of oral history. Oral history is nothing if not a relational practice and an interrelational practice. Um, so some other ways of thinking about this are to think of it as an encounter. Um, to think of it as uh, one of our great theorists, Alessandro Portelli calls it a mutual sighting is what you're trying to go for. So, and this goes along with the next point, the inter slash view. So um, Alessandro Portelli is, um, I think in his late seventies, he's an Italian, um, actually he's an Italian scholar of American literature and folklore. And that's how he came to oral history. Um, and so that's why for me, like I'm a literary person, I'm not a social science person. So Portelli's ways of thinking about oral history make the most sense to me and I think are, are broadly the most applicable. So he writes about the interview as indicated here, an inter slash view. And by that, he means to indicate, of course, that when you're interviewing somebody, um, you are not only in the role of observer, you are also being observed and that people will respond to what uh, to you in the way that you're presenting yourself. Um, this gets us to what Portelli also calls the intersubjective quality of oral history. Um, that again, it's, it's, it's a meeting between two subjects and the quality of the relationship that you have with your narrator, um, both in the interview itself and outside of the interview, um, because you do have to be communicating with your narrator to set up the interview, to go over what the agenda for the interview is gonna be. All of those interactions um, contribute to the quality of the relationship. And that itself, that relationship is part of what will be documented in the interview. Um, you know, of course, for a project like Robert's, you know, where you're dealing with family members, I think this is like extra um, uh, salient, I think, right? Um, your, uh, and, and this goes for everybody's projects, you know, there's always going to be a kind of insider outsider dynamic, I think, right? Like some projects you come as a real outsider. Um, some projects you come as a real insider, let's say as a member of the family, but there will always be ways in which you are different from the people you're interviewing, even if you're from the same community, same neighborhood, you went to the same schools, just by virtue of the fact that you are an individual and they are an individual, there will be some differences between you. Um, and that's part of what makes oral history really pop and sing is that there's differences between you and your narrator. And that provides the grounds for which uh, you can ask questions. Sometimes insiders have, have trouble getting their narrators to really talk fully about things because the narrator assumes that they already know. And so if you're a real insider in your community, sometimes it can be very useful to actually kind of take a step back and try to see things as an outsider might. Um, and same goes for if you're an outsider, right? There are always ways in which um, people can, and sometimes it takes time and work. It's not gonna happen you know, in a, in a moment, but outsiders can develop relationships. I mean, my own work in Little Rock is, is a testament to this. Um, by continuing to show up, by continuing to talk to people about what I'm doing, um, by being humble about um, the insights that people can give me in terms of the content of what I'm doing or, or what I'm investigating, but also um, the way in which I'm doing it. Um, the, the, the things that make for good relationships tend to make for good oral history interviews. Um, number five, this idea of collection building and curation, again, is, um, is not exactly what we'll talk about today, but Robert already kind of put it out there, I think, in terms of wanting to share what he's collecting. Um, I think the fundamental thing, if you're, if you're an oral historian working on a project um, of any kind, whether it's one of your own design or you're working for somebody else, 
um, you know, a project that somebody else is directing. Fundamentally, what oral historians do is build collections of interviews. Um, and I, I've started to think about this in the last few months in the way that um, I, I've been interested by um, just some interviews that I've listened to with, for instance, art collectors or curators um, who talk about like wanting to wanting to get that one piece that'll bring the whole collection together, right? Or thinking about the pieces in the collection as relating to each other or being part of a larger conversation. Um, so if you're thinking about doing your own projects, you want to think about um, what's, you know, what, what aspects of this community do I need to make sure are covered here? What's a sufficiently diverse spread of narrators, right? Whether it's identities or um, certain events that matter to the community that, you know, certain people, you know, maybe some people are too young to remember. So you want to make sure to get some people who are old enough to remember um, what have you. You know, we can talk specifically as, as this relates to your projects, but um, I guess I'm encouraging you to keep in mind that your narrators, of course, speak first and foremost for themselves, but they also speak for some collective dimensions of experience, um, right? Whether that's something that the community has experienced or whether it's that they belong to a social, you know, identity or category such as a race or a gender or a class um, or a generation. Um, and so just be thinking about as you're going about interviewing um, think about your your interviews as kind of pieces of a puzzle um, and a puzzle that can kind of always be getting bigger. It's not like it needs to end necessarily, um, but just be thinking about what does, you know, if you're, if you're getting ready to interview somebody, you want to think, okay, what, in addition to their own life experience, what does this particular narrator, what, what can they add to the conversation or what um, aspects of the community history do they help me um, check off. And, and I'm hesitant to say the word check off because that sounds so mechanical, but if you are creating a project, you do want to be thinking about what are, um, what are some notes that we do need to make sure get hit um, in order to have a representative spread um, or a representative collection of the community history. Um, and then again, you know, curation, uh, we can talk about, there's so many ways to, to work with oral history interviews, um, ranging from very public to very intimate, um, you know, just for the community. Um, and so maybe uh, towards the end of today, we can talk about um, some ideas that you have because um, that's like a whole other presentation I can give about, you know, different approaches or, or different um, possibilities for uh, putting your work out there. Um, and then finally, this, this might be, um, in, in turn, this goes along with relationships. I know I said relationships are kind of the most important thing. Negotiation of agendas is basically the way to think about the kind of interaction you'll be having in the interview. Um, and even before the interview in any of your uh, interactions with your narrators, the agenda of the interview is always being negotiated. Something that I've found over time that I think um, is true of oral historians is because we care so much, like oral historians tend to be a pretty empathetic breed of people. Um, and we tend to be very sensitive to people's, um, especially like emotional needs. Um, Sometimes oral historians can shy away from creating an agenda. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we fall prey to this idea that, oh, if I have an agenda, that means I want something out of this person. And if I want something out of them, that means I'm using them and I don't wanna do that. So I think I'm just gonna go in and just let, let them tell me stories. Um, that is not the best way to approach it. Um, I actually think that a lot of times people, your narrators, your interviewees will look to you for some structure, um, especially if you're the one who called the interview, if you're the one who invited them to participate. Um, having an agenda is not a bad thing. Um, not being transparent about your agenda is a bad thing. And so we'll talk now in the next couple slides about how to go about creating that agenda. Um, but it's the kind of openness to these terms that I put at the bottom here, shared authority, um, which is to say that, uh, authority over the direction of the interview is shared between you and the narrator. So you come with your agenda as the researcher, um, you know, whatever, whatever that may be, whether it's what you've been commissioned to do, let's say you're working for someone's project or it's a project of your own design. Um, you come in with your own objectives and things you want to make sure you cover in the interview, but you always leave room for um, and give at least equal, um, if not equal time, at least equal um, uh, respect for the fact that your narrator will have their own agenda as a storyteller. Um, if they're aware that this interview is going to go live in the archive for hundreds of years, um, there might be some things that they want to make sure they get on the record. Um, and so you want to encourage that and you want to find ways to 
blend your agendas, make them mesh. Um, and that's really part of the art of oral history is that negotiation, um, being able to um, balance, you know, that kind of openness with um, what can sometimes be, you know, natural constraints of time, right? If you're doing a project and you're interviewing many people, um, you might not be able to offer multiple sessions to everybody. And that, and that's just a sad, but, you know, that's just a fact um, of a lot of our project work. And so, um, being able to balance, you know, okay, there are these three things that I definitely do need to cover. Or I definitely do need to be able to ask about um, with that openness to, um, as one of my teachers once put it, um, that there's the idea that there's no such thing as a digression in oral history. That's something that, uh, you know, if you take that idea all the way to its extent, to its, to its logical endpoint, like you'll be talking forever and ever, which can be great. But if you have, you know, a job to do um, and a project to make, um, you do have to artfully and politely and sensitively, um, you know, enforce your own agenda too, but in a way that's still open to others. Um, and the way to do that is, is these next two points of being co-creative, seeing the interview not as something that you're extracting from the person, but rather that you're actually working in collaboration with your narrator to create. Um, and improvisation is really the key to all that. Um, there's preparation, but then there's improvisation. Um, and as anybody who you know, knows something about jazz, for instance, will tell you like improvisation doesn't mean you just show up and start playing whatever comes to mind, right? Like there are standards, there are things that you know you can fall back on. Um, there are structures, um, there is a kind of goal that you might have in mind, but improvisation is a way of dealing with all the things that come at you on your way to that goal. Um, and so as it relates to oral history, that basically has to do with um, knowing that the vast majority of the time of the interview will be spent letting the other person talk, um, think about your questions as a kind of improvisation. Um, one, one way that I think about the interview is as a hundred forks in a road. Um, every time you choose to ask a question or not ask a question, sometimes a lot, a lot of times you'll, you'll actually more often than not make the decision to hold back and not ask a question and let them keep talking or let them keep thinking um, so that they can then verbalize um, all that has to do with improvisation. And that's something that you just get better at over time. Um, and so that's kind of the, one of the main skills I would encourage you all to, to work on and just be aware of um, as you're going about your interviews. Um, before I turn to the next slide, um, I've done a lot more talking than I'm used to doing. Um, people who know me know that I, being an oral historian, I tend to like other people to talk. So let me stop there now that I've laid those kind of basic principles out. Um, let me just take some questions and, and any ideas you have on how this might apply to your projects. So I have a question. Um, so I'm going to be interviewing family members. Um, and when I'm thinking, I've, I've been thinking about some of the questions I would be asking and trying to develop what that would look like. I, I see the idea that I could kind of develop an agenda uh, around, um, you know, childhood, uh, adolescence, adulthood, you know, and, and is it good to kind of lay that out early in the interview so that they kind of have an idea of where you're going? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you want to say just a, a word more about what do you mean by laying that out early? What might that look like? Well, I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm looking at these questions and I mean, I've, they're going on and on here as I tr try to think through the questions I might add. Um, but, you know, I, instead of having 100 questions, I'd love to say, you know, I kind of have maybe six or seven stages of life that I'd like to discuss today. And then I'll kind of have some questions around each one of those things. And kinda, that way, the, the person I'm interviewing kind of has an idea where I'm going. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, let me actually, since you said that, Robert, let me go ahead and pull this up. Um, and actually, before I go there, um, Mr. Tim Holder, do you want to, uh, since you came in late, do you want to say real quick what brings you to the room and um, if you're working on a particular oral history project that I can help you with? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Um, I'm interested, I live in a, in a small city in Northeastern Ohio, and I'm looking at the period of 2020, 2021, uh, the effect of this rather extraordinarily unusual period of time on the citizens of our community. I've been active in our local historical society for years, I'm past president, I'm on the landmark commission in our local community, but I want to get, if it's possible, as a sort of uh, an examination of the attitudes of the people during this really remarkable period of our history. 
And so I'm, I'm trying to get some background information in this. I once, my wife has taken courses and worked in the oral history area prior to now, but she's not participating, but I, I did attend some of her sessions. So I have a little bit of idea about this. I've bought a couple of the books, the uh, oral history and the law and the politics of oral history. Um, and I'm looking to get sort of general background to, to, um, to find out what kind of an approach I want to take, how much I want to limit it, how much I don't want to limit it. And I, I, like, I, I like hearing your exposition. It's very, very interesting to me. Um, I'm sort of open-ended at this point as to where I'm going. I'm hoping to be able to start, I'm thinking, by July 1st of this year. But we'll see. I, I just have to see what, what happens in the community, what happens in the world, and what happens in my life as well. Yeah, that's great. Very good. Thank you, sir. That sounds like a great project. So let me go ahead and share since um, Robert brought it up. Um, this is um, a sample interview guide. Um, and this is what I would encourage you all to, uh, to make. And, and this is not the only format to do it with or to do it in. Um, I'm a big proponent of a kind of inductive method. So whatever way like works best for you. But let me go ahead and point out what I think is, is good about this um, guide, which a former student of mine did um, for the DC Oral History Collaborative was a, um, and it's still going, it's like a citywide grassroots oral history project in the District of Columbia um, sponsored by uh, the DC Public Library in which um, people could come uh, uh, when it first started to get trained by me, now they get trained by somebody else. They get trained by the instructor um, and then when they're done, they're kind of card carrying members of the collaborative and they can go and interview um, anybody in the city who they think is worth um, getting on the record. So actually, um, uh, uh, your name is not popping up, uh, Tim. Uh, Tim's project might, you know, if, if you're thinking about maybe like volunteer um, driven work, uh, you know, getting volunteer interviewers, um, the DC Oral History Collaborative is a good um, model you might engage. Um, but what I like about this guide is it's pretty simple in terms of offering a biographical sketch that gives, um, especially for me, you know, as, as Judy's teacher, like I came to this and I, just from this one paragraph, I, I already had a good sense of what this interview is going to cover, right? Um, so I can give you just uh, a word of context. Judy is a resident of Woodley Park, which is an old neighborhood in DC. And I knew that she wanted to interview residents of her neighborhood specifically. So already that's one of the important framings. And that's a word that I've forgotten to use thus far, framings. Um, one of the important framings for this narrator. So um, to take a quick step back and talk about framing, oral historians are extremely aware of the fact that individual people as Walt Whitman said, contain multiplicities. I think that's a Whitman line, right? Like people contain multiplicities. People have multiple identities, many identities um, that are activated or present or um, performed at different times and in different places. Um, and so as oral historians, because we take such a, such a, a deeply humanistic approach, um, the way I think to go about crafting your agenda for the interview is to think about, okay, of all the identities that the person I'm interviewing might have, what are like three to five, um, you know, depending on how long the interview is going to be, like what are three to five identities that I really want to make sure we like get into um, and by which I will frame this narrator. So in this interview, it's like, you know, Roy Bernard is first of all a, a, a long time uh, resident of Woodley Park and in fact a, a business owner in Woodley Park. Um, he and his partner created the iconic Marilyn uh, mural. So already there, there's a kind of framing of, um, you know, that he's made contributions to the, to the community implied, but all that falls under the framing of like neighborhood resident, right? Um, then that he's an active member of the business community, um, that he still works at the salon serving his longtime clients. Um, that to me implies a kind of framing about business, right? Like I think this interview could have some interesting questions about, um, how do you relate to your clientele? What does being a business owner tell you about the neighborhood, tell you about the city? Um, and then finally, this idea that he himself is a neighborhood icon, um, you know, that just opens up a lot, I think. Um, and so in terms of, just like Robert was suggesting, taking, um, you know, planning for the interview, one way to think about it is um, 
to use the metaphor of a symphony, right? So a symphony will have multiple movements. Um, each one kind of stands on its own, is kind of self-contained, but the sequencing of the movements kind of adds up to something bigger. Um, and so you might want to think about your narrators as having movements in their lives um, and that the movements that you're choosing to highlight and to ask about in the interviews are themselves kind of a function of the framings that you're most interested in, uh, you know, the ways in which you're most interested in framing your narrator. Um, so in this case, you've got childhood and usually we start with childhood, um, right, young adulthood life history interviews tend to go chronologically. Um, there's room to jump ahead and to, you know, stop and ask questions and to go back. But typically you do want to keep it chronological just because that helps, um, it helps it kind of move along and, and gives a kind of structure overall. So childhood, young adulthood, um, Woodley Park, you know, coming to the neighborhood, this is kind of the big research interest of, um, of the oral historian in this case. Um, the mural, right? So that was mentioned earlier that uh, he and his partner painted the mural. Um, so the mural itself is kind of this important historical um, object uh, or even an event. And so framing uh, Mr. Bernard, the narrator here, as the person who made this great historic thing happen, right? Um, that's kind of a sub framing of him as a neighborhood resident. Um, and then finally, zooming back out a little bit to just other questions about his life in the neighborhood. Um, you know, and so we can go through... Uh, you know, there's all kinds of questions to ask. Um, and as you see, you know, questions beget questions. So when Judy turned this into me, um, I kind of went, uh, I don't want to say went crazy, but I, I indulged um, the impulse to just add more questions, right? And that's not to say that you ask all these questions. Um, oral history is not a questionnaire. Um, you should not come in with a list of questions that you're going to just go one by one by one. Um, I'm actually much more a fan of the approach that Robert's proposed, which is just kind of having a broad sense of what are the things we want to cover. Maybe there are a few direct questions um, or, or really important questions that we know we got to ask, um, but leaving enough room for each kind of movement of the interview to breathe um, and for your follow-up questions to really drive it. Um, yeah, does that kind of answer your question, Robert, or get at uh, the, your interest? Yeah, I think uh, maybe a follow-up question to that too. So how much would you share with the person you're going to interview prior to sitting down with them? Great question. Yeah. So I am a big proponent of pre-interview conversations um, for a few reasons. I mean, one, because it helps you start to establish rapport. Um, and even if it's someone that you know very well, let's say for your project, Rob, like, uh, you know, you might interview a cousin or something, you know, a family member that you know quite well. Um, but even if you know them that well, by having a conversation that you call a pre-interview with them, it helps to establish the kind of rapport that you will have in the interview. Um, so even if you already have a standing rapport, um, you know, it's not, if, if it's someone that you've never interviewed before, especially on a recorder, um, the dynamic will necessarily change a little bit just from that situation. And so the pre-interview, whether you know the person well or not, helps you to just kind of warm that up. Um, so that's one, the rapport piece. But then two is, to your question, it does help you start being transparent about your agenda and inviting your narrator to be a, a collaborator on that agenda. Um, and so being very open about, so these are the things I wanna ask you about. What do you think? How would you feel about talking about these things? Um, you can kind of rehearse some actual questions for the interview. So if they start telling you a story in the pre-interview, like sit back and listen, um, you know, maybe take a few notes, um, you know, and ask some follow-up questions. And then when you're in the interview itself, I'm a big fan of saying, okay, you know, so now that we've gotten to this point of the story, um, you already told me in the pre-interview, but for the sake of the recording, if you could go back and tell me about um, when you went to college, let's say, or whatever the question is. Um, so making open reference to the fact that you have had pre-interview conversations. Um, that's the kind of thing that I've found will make traditional social scientists clutch their pearls and freak out, but it's okay. Um, like you have a relationship with your narrator um, and that's part of what makes this a special artifact, the interview itself. Um, so it's good to make reference to previous interactions that you've had, um, especially for a future listener who will have may have no idea who you are. Um, it just helps to humanize and to add some, some kind of context to the interview um, to make open reference to the fact that you've been building up to this, right? Like if you think about the interview as a kind of staged interaction, um, it's the fact that there's a recording going on um, it, itself, uh, you know, it, it helps to kind of warm up to it and to build up to it with, with smaller interactions. Um, 
The other big thing to do, well, I guess I already said this, but the, the other big thing uh, that's important about the pre-interview is um, it's a chance for you to be transparent about your agenda and to answer any questions. And you want to invite questions. You always want to ask, is there anything, you know, do you have, do you have any questions about the project or about what I'm trying to do? Um, and it's also, and along with this, is a, is a great and an ideal chance to introduce um, if you're going to have a legal release, which if your project is destined for an archive, you do want to make sure you get a legal release. Um, actually, the book that Tim brought up, Oral History and the Law, is like the gold standard um, for uh, explaining legal releases um, and actually has some really great templates for legal releases in, in the back of the book. Um, and a legal release, you know, sometimes are written in, in like highfalutin legalese um, and that has its purposes if you're doing a, you know, more formal donation, a deed of gift to an archive. Um, but sometimes, a you know, what, what matters is that there's a kind of stated agreement um, between you and your narrator about what's the use and what's the life of this interview going to be. Um, so this is one way actually that oral history, I think, is distinguished from, say, journalism. Um, journalistic ethics hold that as long as the person knows that you're a journalist and knows the publication you write for, um, until they tell you that something is off the record, you can report it and you can put their name on it. Um, oral historians don't really do that. Um, that's, that's too... Um, that's a little too close to gotchaism, I think, for us. Um, for us, it's much more important to practice uh, what's known as ongoing informed consent. Um, so you want to make sure that the person that you're interviewing uh, is giving you active consent for whatever it is that you plan to do with the interview. Um, now, there are ways to write the legal release such that it gives you permission, you know, from here on out to use this interview, um, and that's great. Like that, that is very efficient. It's helpful. Um, as long as you're open to the possibility that your narrator may want to retract their interview down the line, right? Like if, if, they, if they worry that they said something embarrassing um, or maybe they're applying for a job and they, they want to make sure that there's nothing out there that could compromise, um, you know, that situation or whatever. Um, you do want to be open to, you know, it's, it's um, yes, once the ink is dry, you can proceed along whatever conditions you set in the legal release, but compared to other kinds of researchers, I think we as oral historians, again, are more open to the fact that things change, the fact that the relationship really matters, um, and that the narrator's comfort is probably the most important thing um, to consider when we go about our work as historians. Um, yeah, I kind of took things in a little bit of a tangent. So are there any more questions about that, um, whether it's legal releases? Um, Robert's original question was about pre-interviewing. Um, so anything um, about that? Again, I guess I can just emphasize that um, transparency about your agenda is the most important thing. And if, and if your agenda is still in the works, like be transparent about that too and invite your narrator to help you figure out what that agenda is gonna be. Um, I think sometimes we can be a little afraid of seeming like we don't have every single thing set up in advance. And that's, that, that's totally fine, um, especially if you're doing community-driven projects or community-centered projects, um, finding ways to involve um, whether it's the people you're interviewing themselves or just other members of the community in the overall direction of the of the the project um, that that can be a really that can really strengthen the project. Um, yeah. So yeah, other questions thus far. Let me. I'm gonna skip. Yeah, Minda. Yeah. Sorry. Um, during the pre-interview, I guess as part of the or the pre-conversation to the interview conversation, um, I guess. Um, so I guess this is a good time if people have uh, things that they specifically do want to talk about in the interview, as well as if they don't want things that they don't want to talk about. Like, how do you recommend dealing with those any kind of restrictions that the uh, person you're speaking to? Uh, wants to restrict the conversation in any way. How do you recommend yeah, dealing with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first of all, it's good to get a sense of that before the interview, right? So yet another good reason for the pre-interview. Um, you don't want to be caught off guard. Um, this hasn't exactly happened to me, but a kind of version of this that's not worth going into, but I'll just say it's happened to me that, um, no, it has happened in an interview actually. Like where, like the very thing I said the interview was supposed to be about in the email of invitation and the narrator said yes, um, three minutes into the interview said, oh, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> well, shoot. <laughs> you know? um, but what the Oral History Association actually recommends, um, and I can circulate this afterwards, or if you just want to Google the Oral History Association's best practices, that's a document that's very useful. 
Um, what they recommend is if your narrator says that there's something they don't want to talk about, you respect that. Um, you don't, you know, try to find other way, you know, like, I mean, within reason, I mean, you can try to find other ways to approach the question, but if it's a hard no, you take that uh, at face value. But what I find interesting is they do recommend that um, you ask why they don't want to talk about that thing. Um, and they might refuse that question too. And then if they refuse it, that's fine. But sometimes getting them to talk about why they don't want to talk about something will lead you in interesting directions. Um, so, so I guess there's, there's that. Um, but uh, does that answer your question? I feel like you may have phrased it differently. Did I miss anything? No. no? Okay. Yep. I had an additional question. Um, the, in, in looking at the timetable that I'm looking at, where I'm hoping to start this project by about July 1st, I've also thought about, and this would be the, the pre-stage of, of planning a project, is there, is there any appropriate way to contact one or two of the potential subjects of the interviews um, early before it's really part of the project getting going and just say, is this something that you might be interested in? Might you would be willing to be a participant? I'm sort of trying to get my, my feel for this. I don't really have experience, which is absolutely true. Is that an appropriate way to approach someone early? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great way to do it. Um, again, it sounds like you, you'd you be kind of inviting them to help you think through. Um, exactly. Like the direction. I think that's great. Yeah, that's, that's entirely in keeping with our, again, co-creative ethics as oral historians. Thank you. Um, let me say one more word about pre-interviewing as well that I forgot to mention, um, or maybe that I've explained in other terms. Um, but a really important thing to try to get down in the pre-interview um, is some timelines. So to go back to what I said about, you know, you want to frame your narrator in, let's say, three ways or kind of have three or five framings um, that you want to make sure you get. Um, each of those framings is itself a kind of, there's a story implicit in that. So um, let's take Derek's project with the doctors, right? Like you're framing this person as, um, you know, let's say a resident of Little Rock, a doctor, and a member of this particular medical association. Um, each of those identities has a timeline to it, right? So resident of Little Rock, right? Maybe they're born in Little Rock. Um, you know, the date that they started going to their high school, let's say they went to Central, like, you know, their Central years maybe are really important for their Little Rock story. Um, maybe they left Little Rock and came back. Um, so if you're ever interviewing about place um, or if place is a framing uh, that you're using to, to identify your narrator, um, leaving and coming back are always kind of important points. Um, they always offer fresh perspectives, right? So, um, so if they left Little Rock and came back, you know, those are two dates when they left and then when they came back. Um, and let's just say that, that that's kind of their Little Rock story. And maybe now they're in retirement and maybe they've moved to another part of town or something. So that's one. Um, you'll wanna weave that timeline with the timeline of them becoming a doctor, right? So again, going back to maybe they knew they wanted to be a doctor when they were 10 or something, right? Like, when did you know that medicine was for you? Um, what are, you know, and then maybe going back to high school, like what were, you know, maybe their biology teacher was highly influential to them. Um, so that's another kind of point on the journey. Um, maybe they thought that they were gonna go into some other profession, but they chose to do medicine after like, I don't know, really crushing it in college or something. Um, again, each of these is kind of a point on the journey. Um, and then, you know, for the, for the final one, let's say a member of this association, you know, when they first heard about the association, uh, when they first joined, maybe there was um, some kind of conflict in the association that led to some disillusionment. Um, you know, that's a point on the journey. Um, maybe there was some kind of reconciliation. Uh, maybe the person uh, assumed a leadership position in the organization. Right, like each of these identities has its own timeline to it, and those timelines get woven together because we, as individuals, go through time holding each of these identities all together. Um, and so, something to get in the pre-interview is a sense of what are some important points on the journeys that I'm trying to document uh, with regards to you as an individual, um, and then you'll bring that up in in the in the interview. So I'm a fan of taking notes in the pre-interview, not too much, like you do want to still be available for the conversation, but just taking some basic notes and then having those notes available in the interview, um, not as something, again, not as like boxes to check, but the timeline can really help you, it can just give you structure um, and again, help you kind of keep things moving along 
um, and just remind you kind of what you need to cover, where you got to go back to. Um, so yeah, that's, I just wanted to name that as something important to get in your pre-interviews is just a sense of the timelines that you'll be um, trying to sketch out in the interview. Um, okay, so we're at three o'clock. Let me, um, let me turn, turn back to the uh, PowerPoint. Um, so as, so those who have taken this workshop with me already know, and so I'll, um, I wanna give this quote it's due, but if you feel like uh, you, know, you wanna move on, let me know. Um, this I think explains more than anything, the cast of mind and the way in which we think about people as oral historians. Um, and this conditions the types of questions that we ask. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this quote. This or the crucial feature of human life is its fundamentally dialogical character. We become full human agents capable of understanding ourselves and hence of defining our identity through our acquisition of rich human languages of expression, including the languages of art, gesture, love, and the like. But we learn these modes of expression through exchanges with others. People do not acquire the languages needed for self-definition on their own. Rather, we are introduced to them through interaction with others who matter to us, what George Herbert Mead called significant others. The genesis of the human mind is in this sense not monological, not something each person accomplishes on his or her own, but dialogical. We define our identity always in dialogue with, sometimes in struggle against, the things our significant others want to see in us. Even after we outgrow some of these significant others, our parents, for instance, and they disappear from our lives, our or the conversation with them continues within us as long as we live. How might this apply to some of your projects? Um, how, how do you all think this um, might condition some of the questions or inspire some of the questions um, you might ask in your projects and go about documenting people's life journeys? Well, one of the things that just came to mind for me was uh, as I'm conducting these family interviews of uh, my relatives, my ancestors, uh, I, I should I should know what historical events may have happened during that time frame, so that I I have you know if they don't even bring it up, it's like well you know this particular thing happened, how did that affect and and then let them that might open up some more discussion and and you know really what I'm trying to learn from them is you know here are the stages of life, what did we learn? So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I'll say um, something that one of my teachers uh, first recommended uh, when I was taking oral history classes is um, to go back to this idea of getting timelines in the pre-interview. Um, he actually recommended you have your narrator do a two-sided timeline. So on one side is just all the events in their life that they find significant for themselves, right? Like in their personal history but that on the other side, they note like historical events um, that they also see as significant or that were somehow influential for them. Um, so, you know, of course, something like the pandemic itself, right, should be on everybody's timeline, um, but there might be smaller events, right? Um, certain things that, um, you know, I'm thinking for instance of like Minda and Julia's project, like, you know, uh, people get radicalized or politicized, right, um, by certain events, by seeing certain things, you know, in the news, um, or by, again, going through maybe a personal experience. I mean, as oral historians, we understand that the line between personally significant and historically significant is so blurred as to almost not even exist, but it's still a useful way of, I think, dividing up, um, you know, that which is concretely immediately experienced um, from, you know, that which is influential because it has to do with, you um, feeling like part of a collective, right? Whether it's a nation or a community or some kind of tribe or something, um, those events can be just as important and influential. So yes, exactly. The ways in which people relate to big events um, definitely uh, should go in, in your project, Robert. Any other thoughts on this? Um. Practically speaking, like how long would you suggest people a lot for the pre-interview? Just when, you know, you're setting up expect, you know, shared expectations of how much people, um, how much time people are devoting to each other. Yeah. You know, how much time would you expect to spend on a pre-interview? Yeah. How much time is reasonable if you don't 
if you're not doing a multi-year project that, mm -hmm. you know, one hour, two hours for the actual um, oral history interview itself? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's funny because pre-pandemic, I would always say it should be about as long or at least as long as like a cup of coffee. Like you should just meet to go. And, and this is part of what oral history like, like does and, and kind of abides by is like, you want to get to know your narrator. Um, as much as having an agenda is important, um, especially when you're coming into the pre-interview, part of what you should be trying to do is just get to know your narrator so that by the end of the full interview process, like you should be able to tell, you know, a good friend or, you know, if, if you're working on somebody else's project, like the project director, like you should be able to tell somebody who this person is that you just interviewed. Um, what makes them tick? What makes them special? Um, what's really important in their life story? Um, so you can start to do that. You should start to do that in the pre-interview. Um, so the pre-interview, while yes, you do have, again, a job to do, which is, you know, start to you know, again, establish rapport, um, communicate expectations, start to gather some timeline. Um, part of what you should be trying to do also is just like have a casual kind of first date, so to speak, right? Um, present yourself, have them present themselves to you. Um, and so again, all I have to say that pre-pandemic to me, that's kind of the length of like a coffee meeting. So, you know, 30 to 60 minutes. Um, and I guess I would strive for the same if you're doing them over Zoom. Um, it might be a little you know, it doesn't quite click in the same way as if you're meeting in, you know, in a place to, to talk face to face. Um, but I would say, yeah, in terms of time, like, I would say at least about 30 minutes. Um, yeah, and it could certainly be longer, but I would say thir 30 minutes feels like a good um, kind of sweet spot, especially again, if you don't have the kind of, um, uh, not distractions, but kind of elements of like meeting in person. And you know what I mean? That that can take a little longer. Um, but anything you're able to do to make people feel comfortable and for it to feel casual, right? Like you are not interviewing them as such. Um, you're like preparing for it. And so um, the pre-interview should have a kind of casual feel to it that, you know, might, you know, towards the end, you might say, okay, I do want to make sure like, because we're preparing for the interview, let me make sure I get these dates right. Or let me make sure that I ask you these things. Um, but the buildup to that should be like pretty casual and free flowing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The reason I wanted to bring up this quote um, is, and there's many reasons to do it, but something I think is so important is this idea of the significant others. Um, and so when you're thinking about, okay, I'm going to interview this person and get their life story for my collection. Um, you want to be conceiving of people as, uh, as Taylor, as this philosopher here recommends, not as islands, right? Um, people become who they are by way of interacting with people who were there when they were becoming who they are. And people are still becoming who they are even today. Um, so thinking of people as like kind of like real like tangled balls of relationships themselves, right? Um, and thinking about the relationships not only to significant other people. So that could be again, of course, parents, teachers, preachers, neighbors, you know, neighborhood figures, um, friends, but also relationships to ideas, um, to cultural products like books, television shows, um, you know, artworks. Um, you know, if, if you're really anybody you're interviewing, um, asking them like what their favorite book was when they were 16 is a great question, right? Like it tells you a lot about how they saw things. Um, how they might relate to things. Um, you know, people create relationships to more than just other people, right? Relationships to a to an environment, whether natural or a built environment. Um, relationships to spaces. Um, you may not phrase every single one of your questions as "What is your relationship to that space?" But having that notion of relationship in the back of your mind will help you even have the question in the first place, and then you can phrase it as, "Okay, so tell me about this space. Um, tell me about." Uh, you know, early experiences you had. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples related to your projects. Maybe, um, I don't know, let's, let's say that um, Mind and Julia's project, um, you know, maybe they're interviewing an elder who, um, let's say maybe belonged to a co-op or something, right? Like what was your relationship to that co-op? What was the built space of it? Um, can you remember it visually? Um, getting people to remember things in kind of sensory terms. Um, all of that is, is super fair game and, and really fruitful directions to go in. Um, 
And then you can always go back to like this last idea of Taylor is that we define our identity always in dialogue with, sometimes in struggle against the things our significant others want to see in us. Um, and that we, we continue that dialogue sometimes long after, you know, those folks are gone. Um, you know, like if you were to interview me, for instance, like there are certain things about like my values and who I am and what I see as important that um, for better or worse, like I discovered about myself during my last big breakup. You know what I mean? Like that person is no longer in my life as such, but they're like a presence, you know, maybe not even a conscious presence. Um, but the relationship I had with that person helped me realize some things that I do now see as very important about myself, right? Um, that's just one example, right? Um, the example of parents, of course, but also um, maybe it's a school or it's an environment that, you know, is no longer there, um, but that is still there in memory, right? So just keeping in mind that people can continue to be influenced by things or by people, even after the the, the interactions have long ceased, um, I think is important because then you can always go back and ask about that. So if in the beginning of the interview, they talk about, let's say the school that they went to and how influential it was and how important it was. Um, so here in Little Rock, like a lot of the people that I interview will talk in those terms about, um, about Dunbar junior high and high school. Um, that's an environment that in some ways is no longer there, um, or at least the quality of it is so different that it's, it's really not the same world. Um, but it provides a kind of um, criteria by which people, you know, older folks who maybe did belong to that community might assess what their, you know, what their situation is now um, or how, you know, their grandkids, uh, you know, school experience. Um, so just understanding that people's early experiences provide those kind of um, templates and criteria for making sense of, again, their present um, and their future. Um, any other thoughts on this uh, before uh, I turn to my last handout? Um, let me go ahead and just read this. So this comes from Jerry Alberelli, um, who is the teacher I mentioned who talked about the timelines. Um, Jerry comes to oral history by way of having been a, and, and still being a creative writer and specifically a fiction writer. And so I think the way that he thinks about interviews for me has been highly influential because oral history I think bridges those two realms of nonfiction and fiction in some ways, because we're dealing with fact and we're dealing with people's remembered actual experiences. Um, so fundamentally oral history is a nonfiction genre, but the level of imagination that it requires to ask smart questions about where someone's life went or could have gone, um, you know, to be able to really inhabit someone's narration of their own past, requires a level of imagination that oftentimes we see expressed by fiction writers. Um, and we understand that story, you know, ha always has that quality, even if it's a true story, just the act of shaping and selecting and sequencing and telling a story in a particular way. Those are the same skills that a fiction writer will use. Um, and so Jerry has this, uh, just this really great set of reflections um, or instructions really for oral historians, where he says, and then what happened is probably the most important question you'll ask. It should certainly be the one you ask most frequently in an oral history interview. It's important to remember that an oral history interview is a narrative about the past. It is the story of certain experiences of events that take place over time, usually a long time ago. You are trying to find out what happened or at least what the person thinks happened. Instead of asking for opinions or for a description of how someone was feeling, let's just say feeling about something in the past, ask for a description of the events to which those feelings and opinions are attached. This will help the interviewee to keep one foot in the past, so to speak. The opinions and the feelings will surface in the telling of events, either implicitly or explicitly. For instance, if interviewing a member, a former member of the Communist Party, someone who broke with the party, rather than asking the question, why did you leave the party? So why? You might, in an oral history interview, ask the question this way. Tell me about your decision to leave the party. Do you remember an event that led to that decision? Do you remember the day that you left the party? To the extent that an oral history interview is about ideas, it's about the dramatization of ideas and the consequences of ideas, or put another way, about how ideas are played out in time and space. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is um, this idea of, and again, this kind of goes with our life history approach, like you wanna keep the narrative moving. That's not to say you rush it. Um, you can certainly, again, you can spend as much time as you need to on high school, childhood. Um, you can always go back and fill things in. But this idea that people exist in time, which is basically a, uh, you know, something that's always moving from you know, present into the future, 
um, asking questions that root someone in those experiences, such as tell me about your decision to, that's a much more concretely phrased question than why. And if you were to ask that question, why did you leave the party? Typically you'll get a more abstract answer, um, a more canned or kind of rehearsed answer. Um, whereas if you ask, tell me about your decision to, that is an inherently a narrative driven question. Um, and that will get your narrator to narrate um, a story more than why, right? Why, you know, the answer to why might just be like, cause I didn't like them, right? Right, uh, but tell me about your decision that inherently invites um, more narration. Um, and this, I, this uh, suggestion that Jerry makes of, do you remember an event that led to that decision? Do you remember the day, right? Those are concrete and those place people back um, in the time and space of the particular past that we're interested in interviewing about. Um, so any questions on this before I turn to, um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is how to translate some of our um, more abstract research questions, which are the making of an agenda um, into more concrete and narrative driven interview questions. So this is a good example, I think, of something that um, you all should, should do for your projects is define what your research questions are and what some corresponding interview questions will be. So this is from a project um, that I and Mario, my partner on the project did, where we um, basically were commissioned by the Dean of Columbia's Graduate School to produce a report with some recommendations on how he could make the school uh, more inviting and inclusive to students of color who had recently expressed to him that the school was not welcoming um, or uh, accommodating to them. Uh, so that was kind of our, uh, you know, that's a big research question. Like what about Columbia is appealing to students of color and what about Columbia could be better for students of color? Um, those are questions that, you know, one might ask that the Dean himself might've asked in a questionnaire, right? That could have been sent out to all students, but he recognized that there was value in having an oral history project ask those questions because by couching those questions in an oral history interview, again, it provides a lot more context um, and it provides, I think, much richer and more nuanced and more honest and fuller answers. Um, and so rather than leading with that research question, right, which is how do graduate students at Columbia, graduate students of color understand their own identity um, what experiences, relationships, social contexts have contributed to that understanding, which would lead us into the next research question. Okay, given that we know who this person is, what about Columbia was appealing to this person um, and to the group of people that they represent, which is students of color, and then to what extent do they feel that they belong, right? Like these are all kind of our $64,000 questions. They are, we made them more concrete and these were the actual questions we asked in the interview Again, keeping in mind an attentiveness to this idea of significant others and knowing that people, people's sense of self is always developing in response to the environment that they're in and the people and the ideas and the cultural products that they're relating to. Um, and so, for instance, we used, we basically took Jerry's advice here and in wanting to understand what about Columbia is appealing to students of color, uh, we asked what led to your applying? Right? Do you remember the day you found out you were accepted? Um, and then a more abstract question, like what were your expectations? Right? Um, and all of this provided the ground for eventually getting to, um, this is like the real like $64,000 million question. Um, right? Like, tell me about your department. Tell me about your research. Um, we're putting the emphasis on the individual experience that will just by virtue of it being narrated, we'll answer some of those bigger questions. Um, and especially because we interviewed about 50 students, uh, we then synthesized some of their answers into a broader report that talked about common themes, right? That talked about certain tropes or, or kind of uh, not tropes, but like narrative elements, you know, things again that are common to all the interviews or to many of the interviews. Um, and so we kind of took that uh, kind of concrete to abstract approach, uh, if that makes sense. Um, I feel like I'm not, um, I'm a little worried that, I'm, that I myself am kind of in some abstract realm here. So anything we can do to relate this to your projects, um, let's do it now. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And any questions or thoughts or ideas that you have about your own projects, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to answer and to- I have a question, Benji. Yes. Uh, it has to do with what one does with all this material you collect, all the, the oral, material that you collect if you want to share it with others. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, what is the question? Like, how do you go about doing that? Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it. Um. I. In so, in some ways, it depends so much on the project. Um, and I think the first thing to ask oneself is, who am I really trying to reach with the with these stories? Um, who's the audience? Um, so to go back, for instance, to the Columbia Life Histories project. Um, the whole time we were aware of the fact that our primary audience was an audience of one, that is the dean who commissioned the study, who was in a position to actually make changes based on the insights that the narratives um, provided. Uh, so that, that conditioned some of the questions we asked, and that was when we were writing our report, you know, we knew that we might want to publish the report. We knew that, of course, it would be interesting to more than just this one dean. Um, but in writing the report, we kept reminding ourselves that this, you know, it is an audience of one and that primarily we need to serve him and answer his questions. Um, but if you're thinking about broader, you know, more public venues like a website or even an archive, um, a podcast, um, even there, you still want to be asking yourself, who's the target audience? Um, and I think that will lead to your selection of, you know, what clips or what parts of the interview you're going to be engaging or synthesizing. Um, but there's so many directions it can go in that it's almost like a project by project, um, you know, set of considerations. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe, Robert, do you want to jump in on, like, do you have any preliminary thoughts, at least in terms of how you're going to do this with, um, with your work? Still struggling a little bit with that. I, I have a, uh, a website, lindleyfamily.org, that is uh, probably where some of this is going to exist, probably in a WordPress format somewhere down the road. Uh, because I found Ancestry is pretty limited in the file size I can upload. So mm -hmm. doing a video interview and uploading that. Um, I am right now working with several uh, historian groups uh, that are researched in different areas of our family history. And uh, I found uh, Facebook groups is a great way to get that information out. It's not out to everyone, but it's, it's out to those that are really interested. You know, the, uh, the Zoom calls we're having where we're doing the research is an oral interview, basically, and we're we're kind of uh, sharing that with each other, which is kind of fun. I, something to share with you. So you got me thinking about what my, what's my primary research question for these family interviews, right? So um, uh, what have we learned in our life that we want to share with future generations? What are the mistakes we made in life we hope not to repeat? They don't repeat. Uh, what are the blessings in life we hope they experience? Wonderful. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Good. And I can yeah. chime in real quickly. I'm back. Um, I've been back. I've just been listening quietly. Um, I can chime in real quickly about, you know, there are places that, you know, there are archives that would love to have um, people's oral histories and family history. It's, you know, it's an important repository. There are genealogy centers all over the country um, that, that love to get this kind of stuff um, as well as, as, archives at universities and archives at, um, you know, there are places out there where you can, where you can leave your stuff, but we will be doing, I don't know when, I mean, it's still kind of percolating in my head, but at some point soon we will be doing classes on how to take your family history stuff and create a website and get it out there. Um, because Creating a website is so easy and we'll be using WordPress, Robert. Um, it is so easy. To, I mean, it's so easy to do, y'all. Y'all just, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, and so you can get it out there um, and people can see it and people can find it. And um, and face, you're right. Facebook groups is a great place. You know, sometimes you can just Google. I like to Google names every once in a while, my family names, and you'll find some, there's some old stuff out there on the internet. I mean, like as in older looking websites, but they still have great information on them. So those are some options. And yeah, and let me say one, one last thing to, to Linda's question. Um, so something I haven't, a word I haven't used yet is stewardship. And this is something also that's really important to us as oral historians. Um, it kind of relates to the question I, I think I came in on when we were starting between Robert and Heather, like that one person in the family who, who is like the keeper of all the stuff. Um, 
as an oral historian, you will very quickly after your first interview, you are then the steward, you are the keeper of that person's story. And that's something to really take very seriously. Um, and so when you're doing acts of interpretation, right, which is what this is, right, publicizing interpretation, um, you want to have that in mind, right? So you don't want to do anything that's going to, and of course, this goes without saying, you already know this, but you don't want to do anything that's going to be, right, harmful or, um, you know, negative uh, for the person, um, you know, if they put their trust into you. Now, there's, there's, if you're working as, as like a, as a professional historian or, or doing a more kind of academic study, there's certainly room to be critical. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you don't want to catch people off guard if you're going to be analyzing their interviews in ways that might lead to some critique or something or some kind of reading of their interviews. Um, but to go back to the idea of say like a website, um, you know, I think you want to give context, right? And that's why I ask like, what, what kind of audience do you have in mind? Because, you know, different people will come to whatever story you're telling with different um, like frames of reference, right? And their own context. And so if um, I'm trying to think about your project, Linda, like, you know, you're, you're having the, the students interview um, some adults from the school if let's just say you're going to make a website just for for the example if the website is going to be geared primarily towards like the world right let's say to like other schools um you know just anybody who wants to come um you'll probably want to do a little bit more of telling the school's story up front right like you want to establish uh, the frame of reference that you want to make sure everybody has going into these narratives um but if let's say rather than a website you were to do just like a listening party just for members of the school community where you might play some clips and, and have some discussion, um, you might not need as much contextualizing, right? Because people know what the campus is like or people know, you know, what the kind of founding um, principles were. Um, though you might still wanna do that contextualizing just to get everybody on the same page. Um, again, it, it depends on, on the particular event or the particular uh, outcome. Um, but generally I would say that idea of contextualizing. And, and if you're thinking about yourself as the steward of people's individual stories, you're also kind of the steward of the overall, the collective story that they help tell together. Um, so it's just kind of keeping those criteria in mind, I think of like, what do I make sure the audience needs to know? What do I, yeah, what does the audience need to know um, in order to engage with these interviews appropriately um, and doing what you, uh, what you need to do to tell that? Because um, just one, one last word on this, the, the idea of shared authority that I mentioned a few minutes ago or a while ago, which is the, the authority that's between you know you and your narrator and how you have a shared authority or control over the direction of the interview. Um, the phrase shared authority was actually first coined in oral history by a guy named Michael Frisch, who taught for a very long time at the University of Buffalo. And his book called A Shared Authority um, actually deals less with the authority that's shared between narrator and interviewer um, which is how oral historians tend to think about the topic and actually deals more with the authority that's shared between the object, like the story that gets told and the receiver, like the audience member. Um, so he writes, for instance, a really great essay on a PBS documentary about um, uh, farmers in China um, that was produced by PBS and that got a screening at the University of Buffalo. He writes about the vastly different reactions uh, to the documentary uh, comparing uh, like American born students reactions to the documentary. They were like, oh, this is so interesting. This is great. Versus the few students who were born in China and going to the school were like, this documentary leaves out so much. Like there's a lot, you know, there's stories that we know aren't being told. Um, and so just understanding that there will always be an interaction between what you put out and the people that are receiving it. Um, if you can be aware of that and be smart about that, that will, I think, help you, um, you know, again, present the interviews in the most appropriate way. So it's 3.31, so I know we're out of time, but I'm happy to stay and uh, answer any more questions. Um, yeah, make this relatable in any way I can. Well, it's always Benji, thank you. I mean, I'm gonna leave time for questions, but I will do a quick closing and then I'll turn the recording off. <laughs> um, thank you again, thanks everybody for showing up and um, being here today. If you have any questions, you can always reach us at arcinfo.cals.org. That's A-R-K-I-N-F-O at C-A-L-S dot org. That's a lot of letters. Um, so that's where you can find us. And um, if you email there, it can get to me, it can get to Benji, it can get to one of our other genealogists or family historians. So thank you, everyone. And I will turn off the recording.